All right, thank you. Um, it's really honored to be here during sort of the 10 year uh, anniversary of the Scala Days Conference. And um, I was brainstorming with Martin on what to talk about. And I offered, hey, I could talk a lot more about how Spark and Scala has been working together, how great and essential Scala is to Spark. And Martin said, why don't you talk about something else? Um, the rest of the conference filled up with Scala stories and uh, conferences and text. Um, so let's talk about something else. And all right. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about actually three different things. One is I want to tell for those of you that have never been to a Spark Summit conference and didn't know how Spark was started, I'm going to tell you the story of how Spark truly was uh, first created. And then a lot has changed since Spark was created. So we're going to talk to you about what has changed, what are the new problems we have seen among our customers as Spark users. And two of the open source projects were created um, in response to those, Delta and MLflow. Right. Um, just a little bit more about myself. I was doing my PhD at UC Berkeley Amp Lab. Um, the thing that I'm most proud of is actually I've deleted more code than added in Spark um, once you consider all the pull requests combined. Um, the <laughs> Basically, the night my net contribution reached zero, um, I popped a bottle of champagne. I'm like, great, I've made it. Um, the, so here's the three things I'll be talking about. Let's get started. Um, Spark is also around 10 years old by this time. Um, it started as a very sort of academic prototype around 10 years ago. And the reason we started um, was because of this guy, Lester. And 10 years ago, Lester was a PhD student also at the UC Berkeley Amp Lab. He was doing machine learning advised by Michael Jordan. Um, the, and Lester back then found out one thing online, which is the Netflix price. How many of you remember what this thing was? Right, about like a third of you put up your hands. Um, Netflix back then decided, hey, we're going to create a challenge by anonymizing all our data set, movie rating data sets by our users. And we'll put this out and create a public contest. Whoever can come up with the best recommendation algorithm for movies will win a million dollars. A million dollars is a lot of money for Lester back then. Um, Lester was making about $2,000 a month out of his stipend. Unlike the PhD students at EPFL here, was making a lot more. Um, the, so he jumped on the, con, um, the contest. But he soon realized, hey, this is the first data set he had to work with that was larger than the amount of disk space on his laptop back then. And he needed some solution to actually scale out to process all of those user um, rating data. And he looked around. There's not a lot of good solutions back then. They either work really well on a single node, but doesn't work well in a distributed setting, or they work well in a distributed setting, but it's very inefficient to prototype. It's very slow to iterate. So let's talk to this guy, Matei, Matei Zaharia, who many of you know, sort of the original creators of Spark. He told Matei, hey, I think if you give me a couple of primitives, um, I could actually leverage that to prototype my machine learning algorithms very quickly. And one of the key with machine learning is you have to be doing a lot of experiments. So iterative speed matters a lot more than the result you get in these um, particular snapshot in time. So Matei actually wrote, um, I think he, he might have first tried Ruby and then later decided, hey, this doesn't really work. Um, let me use a more proper language. And then he actually picked up Scala. So I think Scala was also one of the first, uh, pro um, actually, Spark was one of the first projects Matei used Scala for. Um, the, so about a weekend later, only 600 lines of code. That's the very, very first version of Spark. Of course, it looked very different from Spark, um, what Spark is today. Um, but we call it the first unified analytics engine in the sense that Spark had two functionalities. One is there's a way to process data because a lot of, um, sort of, t a lot of parts of the machine learning is about how to process and prepare the data to be ready for machine learning models to train on. The second part is you actually use Spark to prototype machine learning algorithms, especially distributed ones. And it's kind of Spark just took off slowly from there. Right? But what happened to Lester? It's usually what people care about. So this is the actual leaderboard of the Netflix price from back then. Um, and you can see the top two places are tied. Um, Lester was part of the ensemble team. But the ensemble team submitted 20 minutes later than the first place. So they lost a million dollars. And here's a picture of the other team happily accepting the check. <laughs> if Spark was invented 20 minutes earlier, Lester would have been a million dollar richer. All right. 
Now, a lot has changed. We started Databricks, the company, in 2013, about six years ago. Um, we started working with a lot of real, sort of real world customers in production, and we tried to sort of understand, hey, what are people doing with data? What are the biggest challenges people are facing? And there's a couple of assumptions we make um, when we started Databricks. One, and I think a very important one was, hey, Spark's a unified analytics engine, that's all you need. We can do machine learning, it can train the models for you, it can do data prep for you, that's it, we're just gonna focus on that. Everything else, let's forget about it. But as we work more and more with customers, um, we start to realize, hey, Spark is pretty powerful, but there's actually a lot of surrounding pieces that are core to, I say, data engineering and also software engineering that are not really solved by Spark itself. It's, as a matter of fact, it's a completely different paradigm that Spark doesn't even touches. So it's not even appropriate to just extend Spark to cover some of the use cases. And one of the um, misconceptions about machine learning in this industry is when you talk to a lot of um, people that haven't done it for a while, they would think, hey, machine learning is about if I do download TensorFlow or download PyTorch, and I apply the latest neural net architecture, and I feed some data into it, and boom, um, I get great results. But the reality is, there's actually a lot more to machine learning than just machine learning itself. And this is, I think this is probably the best illustration of that. Um, I've taken it out of a Google NIPS paper in 2015 called uh, Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems. And what this chart shows is Google has taken, um, they've done an analysis of all, all their machine learning applications within Google. And each of the box represents a specific module for the machine learning applications. And the size of the box indicated basically the amount of code um, that's written for those systems. So the proxy for complexity of the components. As you can see, or maybe you can't see, in the middle of it is a little black box that says machine learning code. And everywhere else is a lot of other boxes, configuration, data collection, verification, serving, infrastructure resource management. All of that are not specific to machine learning, um, but are things that need to be done. Right? As a matter of fact, when you have to build real world machine learning applications, you spend most of the time doing this. And even more interestingly is people that really understand the black box are the hardcore data scientists or machine learning engineers. But people that actually understand um, the rest of the boxes are what we call data engineers or software engineers. And these two personas use very different technologies. They often sit in different places. In many enterprises, they don't even have the same reporting chain. One of my favorite questions when I go to a customer is ask them, hey, do you know where, if I see a data scientist, I ask them, hey, well, do you know where data engineers sit in the building? And often the response is no. I occasionally talk to them on Slack. And the tech they use is also very different, which created a lot of challenges in building these overall systems. So what we've been doing a lot at Databricks after realizing that is how do we bridge the gap between the different personas? How do we actually um, make all of this work by enabling people to collaborate, by unifying them? All right. um, so with that, I want to talk to you about two separate projects. The first one is Delta. And it's about scalable and reliable data lakes. And the key to Delta is to focus on making your data ready for analytics, which could include a lot of them are just doing machine learning. And the second part is MLflow, which focuses more on the lifecycle management of machine learning. Let's get started. Um, I don't know how many of you are data engineers here. Um, Scala is extremely essential to data engineers' life. Um, many data Scala is basically a de facto programming language for data engineers. A lot of it thanks to Spark and Kafka and a lot of the frameworks. Um, but one of the big sort of change in uh, the industry for um, data in the past decade is the transition or the addition of the data lakes um, in addition to just your old school data warehouses. And the concept of data lake is pretty simple. Um, you collect all of your data, everything you have, structure, unstructured, sensor data, images, tables, transactions, logs, and dump into this data lake, which typically is a distributed file system or some object store in the cloud, like S3. Um, and then you can have all your data there for downstream analytics use cases. Do fancy machine learning algorithms, um, do data science on it, and your world is perfect. And it's kind of the picture the industry has painted. Right. And when we started Databricks, one of the assumptions we went with is, hey, is let's focus on compute, which is Spark, and storage, data lake is about storage. I think it's a solved problem. We actually believe this picture. Um, until we started building um, so data lakes ourselves, and we realized a few problems. And here's 
essentially mirrors the journey we had to go through um, at Databricks in building our internal data lakes and a lot of our data pipelines. So what does it look like? What we wanted to do is we have a lot of events that we collect from all our services. Um, they're actually in, in the order, I think, tens of terabytes a day. And then there's a few things we want to do. One is we want to report our metrics in real time so we can see what exceptions are occurring um, across all of our managed Spark clusters. We want to see how people are using the Spark clusters, how people are using Spark APIs. Um, and so it's a streaming analytics. And at the same time, we also want to dump all of those into a data lake so we can do historic analysis. For example, when we want to analyze, we want to decide, hey, what um, API can we break in the future for, say, the next version of Spark? We need to analyze how often do people rely on the API. If it's an API that almost nobody uses and it's causing a lot of pain, maybe we should re remove it. Right? And then we also have sort of uh, machine learning algorithms running to predict, for example, what's the behavior of different uh, customers and users in terms of usage. Now, the first thing we have to build is, hey, this build streaming analytics, all right, um, once we dump all the events into Kafka, it's not too difficult to actually get Spark working. You write sort of a streaming job in Spark, and you can uh, get your streaming analytics in. Right? You get your events coming in in a few seconds later, and they show up on a dashboard somewhere. It's great. Now, the problem is, hey, but we do also want to analyze and save all those events. Um, and our dashboards can't just look at the last maybe day. It also needs to look at, in many cases, when we present, for example, to the CEO or um, to the board, you need to show historic trends. Right? So we apply this neat little trick called Lambda architecture, which many of you might have heard of. And what it does is, hey, you bifurcate your pipelines. You have one pipeline for real time, and you have one pipeline for batch, which is basically the offline historic data. Now, every time you bifurcate in software engineering, you risk architectural tech debt as well as correctness bugs, because now you have to write everything twice. Right? But it's not too bad, because Spark, in many ways, the Spark API allows you to express one um, set of program. And you can run it both in a batch fashion and in a streaming fashion. And all you need to do is really configure it. <coughs> and then the other thing we need to do is, okay, we need to do AI on the reporting. But one of the problems with actually streaming data is it creates a lot of, um, as, you create, as you have events coming in real time, and you want to really drive down your latency, we start writing out the data very quickly to your data lakes, in our case, S3. And as part of that, you create a lot of actually, um, there's a few problems. One small data, um, small files. So you create a lot of small files, and you turn down your profile jobs. The time are dominated by just metadata fetching of those small files, or even just file that stick. Um, the other problem is, as the number of pipelines increase, so I'm drawing you here just one simple diagram. But in reality, the different data engineers writing different pipelines, sometimes collecting from different data sources. When you actually um, have one program writing data in a specific schema, and another program written three months later, maybe by a different team. They assume a slightly different schema writing to the same source. Now you have pretty messy data. Um, so people added validation. Hey, let's make sure we have a validation jobs. Um, and of course, you have to add it to both places. Right? And the other bigger problem is, hey, um, we write software with bugs. Everybody does. Um, what happens if there's uh, actually some failure? Um, sometimes not even because of our bugs, because the machine went down in the middle of processing. Um, the, the way sort of most of industry uh, worked out to uh, tackle this is they partition their data in disjoint chunks, for example, by date. And every time if there's a fa failed job and you have partially written out a specific set of data, um, for example, for today, the next time we want to fix it, you overwrite the entire day of data. Now it's just adding more and more logic to the application. Um, and then you reprocess today's data. And sometimes you found a bug three days maybe later, you replace all of the three days data. I'm um, reprocessing. And then the other one is, hey, but occasionally I realize, hey, maybe one of my customers changed their name. I don't really want to, like, how do I actually update that, reflect that in all my records? Um, the standard process is that's actually do uh, also partition replacement. So sometimes you partition the customers. Um, you partition the data also by customers, and then you replace the entire customer's data. Sometimes if you can't do that, for example, you have too many customers, uh, you have to rewrite all of your data. 
it's kind of very difficult. And then the last but not least is, hey, I have downstream jobs also doing maybe real-time querying um, on the data that I've written out. And now, every time you have a reprocess, the reprocessing required deleting some of the existing data. And if there happened to be one of the jobs that's actually reading the data that's being deleted, that job would fail. So now you have to even come up with this sort of scheduling ways of doing, hey, man, so sure maybe I only run in at 3 a.m. San Francisco time until we added a European office, and then everybody, everybody's screwed. Right. So there's a lot of complexity. And what we realized, we have this team called Data Engineering Team with five people, five engineers. They're rock solid data engineers. But really, what they're solving is not data problems. They're just solving a lot of distributed system problems um, and concurrency problems. And that's because actually the underlying data lake doesn't provide them the sufficient guarantees. And they are distracted by, I think, three or four uh, big things. And here I'm going to maybe articulate a little bit more. The first is no automaticity um, provided by the underlying data lakes. The storage system just takes whatever uh, it gets. If you have a partial write coming from a job that actually failed, the storage system doesn't understand any of it because it's just a, sort of a distributed file system. It doesn't have any higher level semantics. And when you have actually partially written data, it's very difficult to trust the data system. And the other one is there's no quality enforcement. You could have it writing garbage. You could have data coming from with slightly different schema. Um, and that's very difficult to actually uh, make sure the downstream jobs are correct. And last is there's no isolation, which means when you have a write job that's deleting data that's due to reprocessing, the read job would just fail. Right? And maybe to show you how real and how widespread this problem is, um, I've also went through a lot of my emails that I've sort of, uh, support tickets I've gotten from our customers. And I've taken screenshots of them. I've sort of, uh, anonymized it. Um, there's a lot of problems with data lakes, despite them being sort of 10 year old mature technologies. Um, one, here's some examples extremely slow data frame loading, commands block on metadata operations. When we profile them, Hey, the query itself finished me by like one or two seconds, but it spends like a minute listing files, figuring out what to read. Data integrity is very difficult. You get found or found exception. Um, this is what I was talking about when you have a read job that's uh, reading while a write job is deleting data. Um, different fields have conflicting schemas because now you might have data, a program written in different times that assume different schema. Um, and you see a lot of this coming. Too many small files is one of the classic. If you spend any time dealing with data engineering, um, concatenate, hey, if I have too many small files, I need to concatenate them. How do I control them and all that? Right, everybody runs in. As a matter of fact, at some point, this class of issues, I think, take up half of our engineering support ticket. So we started working on, um, after realizing that, hey, half of our support tickets have not, very little to do with Spark or anything. It's really just the underlying storage system doesn't quite provide you the right guarantees. Um, we started a new open source project called Delta. And before I tell you how Delta works, um, I'll just um, maybe explain to you what the picture looked like when you go from this to Delta. This is pretty complicated. But with Delta, <coughs> here's the picture you would get with Delta. So you still have all your events that's coming in from a variety of different sources, and you actually dump them into a single Delta table. And typically, the first delta table would be a, what we call a bronze table. Um, and it just includes raw events. And then you incrementally refine them. You create sort of a pipeline of delta tables. And each of them, you have some ETL job connecting them um, to go from one to another. And what we see, it, you might not actually get, for example, exactly three. You might have a pipeline of 20. You may have a pipeline of 30. And you might bifurcate because you have different business logics. But the way it works is the first one is typically the raw events. And there's like no parsing, virtually no application logic. So it becomes an archive and it's a, with infinite retention because it's how much you can fit in your distributed file system R3. And then you incrementally refine. The quality of the data goes higher and higher as you go um, through this delta pipelines. And at some point, you have some data that's completely ready for analytics. Um, that's either doing machine learning or either doing streaming or doing uh, dashboarding. And what Delta provides is a few guarantees. One is 
it has full asset transactions. Um, so now you actually get atomicity, you get isolation, um, and you get basically the SQL style um, transactions. And that was open source powered by Spark. Um, but maybe just walk through a little bit. So bronze table, as simple as possible. So whatever you read in, right? The whole point of that is to store all of the raw data. Let's click on that being a little bit weird. Um, and then <coughs> the intermediate table, sometimes maybe you parse, you do some parsing, for example, JSON parsing. So now you structure the JSON into different fields, and maybe you clean up some garbage you have. And often the business level aggregates, people actually roll up the data. For example, you might be getting your events data in, say, microsecond um, granularity. But for the purpose of the end um, use cases, you don't quite care about the microsecond granularity. So you roll them up every second or even every day sometimes. Right? And now you can actually read that with Spark and uh, Presto. And one of the key here is, hey, it looks OK. Now you have a line. And maybe you can bifurcate. So you have a tree. Like, well, what's the big deal here? One other thing is, hey, if your business logic changes, let's say the way you parse date time changes slightly because you realize, hey, you're getting date time in different formats now. Um, it's actually very easy to uh, reprocess all the old data because all of them are stored in a single delta table um, with infinite retention. You can go back as long as you want. And then all you need to do is write maybe a batch job to actually, um, actually all you need to write is write a Spark job that could run either in batch or uh, streaming. And then just delete, wiped out your downstream tables, like the silver and gold tables. And then just restart that streaming job from a specific point in time. So it's pretty powerful. It makes a lot of things very simple. Um, it essentially, after we rolled out Delta, among the customers that uh, started using it, we started seeing very few of the uh, uh, tickets filed at that point. But how does it work, right? We have the technical conference people care about exactly how does it work under the hood. It seemed like a little bit magic. Um, it, the way Delta works is actually pretty simple. We apply a lot of the old school database techniques, and we basically do this new setting with some tweaks. And the idea here is we have a write ahead transaction log um, for data. And if you look at any of the Delta table that's stored um, under the hood, you will realize, hey, there's data files. And the data files are typically partitioned by, for example, date um, or country. And you have the data files that store in parquet format, which is the most common columnar format for our data. And then um, you have the transaction log in addition to just storing a bunch of raw files. The transaction logs are labeled. They're monotonically increasing. It was like 0.json, 1.json, just keep going up. And a table is basically defined by a set of actions in the transaction log. And the different actions here are, uh, I'm just going to list all of them. You have adding a file, removing a file, um, and there's a bunch of other things. It's a little bit difficult. I'm not going to get into here. Um, but once you have actually, for example, read in all of the transaction logs, you effectively have the latest snapshot um, of the table. You know what are the valid files in the table. And if you want to actually change it, um, <coughs> the table, we'll just keep adding the new uh, transaction log files to it. For example, the first version, the first transaction log, 0.json, might say, hey, I'm adding first file and second file. But let's say you realize, hey, 1.parquet and 2.parquet is too small. And reading them is not really efficient. Let's actually coalesce and combine them um, into a single bigger file. You could actually create a new transaction, 1.json. And what it describes is, hey, let's remove 1 and 2.parquet and add 3.parquet, which is just by writing um, 1 and 2 together. Right? Um, it's pretty simple. Now, one thing to actually enforce uh, and to give you actually transactional guarantees, we need to agree on the ordering of changes. So when there are multiple writers, when there are multiple writers, for example, if the user one writes 0.json and user two writes 1.json, but then they both try to write 2.json, one of them has to fail. So in this case, if user two races and actually wins, user two will claim the two basic version two. Right? But um, in many cases, if there's actually no conflict, user one could just retry, and the software does it automatically for the user, so the user doesn't have to worry about it, to write 3.json. But how do you actually solve conflict? Because for example, two transactions might conflict. They might be, for example, compacting the same set of file and then write them out. Then you actually have data duplication. 
um, it's also pretty simple. Really, what we do is, hey, if somebody else commits before you, for example, in this case, user two commits uh, after user one. So when user two tries to commit, you realize, hey, one's taken. What I need to do is I'll read in one.json to understand what was returned and what was deleted. And if the right set of the uh, uh, user one's transaction didn't conflict with my recent user two, um, I could just commit again without actually failing the end user's job. But if there's a real conflict, for example, both are deleting the same file, it probably means an actual application logic conflict. Now you need to fail the job of user two to tell the user, hey, somebody else have done something that conflicts with uh, what you're doing. So you can try again. Now, up until this point, hey, this is like super simple. If you've ever taken a database internals class, you know exactly what's happening here. Right? Um, but one of the big uh, change with big data is, hey, if you have a streaming job that's coming in, and every maybe half a second or even 100 milliseconds, you're writing a new transaction, you're going to have a lot of JSON files. So wouldn't it be a problem if um, you just turn the metadata or too many files from you, too many metadata files from? Right? So we thought about this a lot, and we decided, hey, we actually have a very scalable engine to process a large amount of data. And if the metadata really gets too large, why don't we treat metadata exactly as data? So it's not, metadata is not a special class um, in the system. And what we do is every once in a while, we actually take all the JSON files, read them in using Spark itself, and we checkpoint them into Parquet format. So it's extremely scalable, higher throughput to read. And then in the future, we'll just read that checkpoint directly from uh, using Spark itself. So all the metadata becomes just normal data here. And this is how we could also, for example, process billions of files in a single table. And you could have actually 100 petabyte tables uh, because all the metadata are no longer bottlenecks. Um, I don't have enough time to go into the different use cases of Delta here, um, but the project is basically one year old. Um, it's been in production one year old uh, at Databricks. We recently open sourced it about two months ago. Um, every month right now, it's processing actually a zettabyte of data um, on the Databricks platform. And um, it's, the number is actually increasing very quickly. Um, the thing is production ready. It solves a lot of the data engineering problem. They've decided, hey, it doesn't just benefit data Databricks customers. We're going to create an open source version of it to actually make sure uh, it works for everybody. All right. So data, Delta is about basically the data engineering pieces of analytics and machine learning. Um, the next one I want to talk to you about is MLflow, which is machine learning lifecycle management. Yeah. And if I were to take a more machine learning view um, of data pipelines, uh, or just machine learning pipelines, already I've shown you a um, chart of breaking down into different components. But here, let's simplify a little bit to just basically three steps. Um, this is a typical process machine learning engineers and data scientists go through. And what they do is they prepare, first they need to prepare data. A lot of it is done in Spark. A lot of it is done um, these days also in Delta. And second is based on those data, they will be building models. And one of the things, as I uh, talked to you about earlier, is, hey, the thing about machine learning is you've got to be experimenting a lot to get to the best result. It's not about the best result at a particular snapshot in time. It's about iterate, iterations. So you have to build a lot of things. You have to be doing a lot of experiments. And then last but not least, once you have something you're actually kind of happy with, you have to deploy it in production. Right? You can't just build a model and say, hey, I'm done with it. You've got to use that model somehow. And there's actually very disparate technologies throughout this entire stack. Um, the technologies are not really designed to work with each other. And as I said earlier, you also require different personas, different just engineers and scientists, um, and they need to be working together. But there's really no tool um, before to make them uh, easier to work together. And so we argue there also needs to be a way for standardization across these uh, three steps. And this is why we actually started the open source uh, MLflow projects with three separate components, tracking projects models. Where I'll go into each one of them. So, but before I explain um, MLflow, let's paint a little bit of a before and after picture. So here's how a very sort of a Python, maybe model of training uh, code could look like. A lot of data scientists use Python. Um, which, by the way, is also a problem because most data engineers don't use Python. Um, but they load some data in. They, this is like the different functions they've returned and write sort of uh, print debugging, right? 
Um, they say, hey, this is all my parameters for my machine learning model and for my data. And uh, here's sort of the accuracy I get based on my test data set. And once I'm done with it, I'll dump the model somewhere with Python Pickle. Um, so I can actually reuse it later in a different program. And so this is a result you actually get looking at the standard out. Um, and now there's different questions. Hey, what if I change my input data? This doesn't describe my input data. It describes uh, the parameters. Um, machine learning model is produced by a combination of code, parameters, and data. When your data set changes, you get different models. And what if I tune some of the other parameters? Now, maybe I should put it in a spreadsheet. Um, and what if I actually update? What if the library I depend on get upgraded and they fix a bug, which actually led to a regression in my model? And over maybe a span of a month, I've changed my program quite a bit. What happened? When I got this log file, what did it happen, right? So people, a lot of them use Excel spreadsheets or like Google spreadsheets to track a lot of this. And funny things happen. I remember very similar to uh, sort of the situation I had ran into when I was in uh, college taking physics labs. Um, I remember we were working on a small team and we are doing experiments. So I would start tracking the experiments in uh, Excel. And then of course I had to email my uh, colleague those uh, experiments. So I would send them one dot, like v1 dot um, xls, v2, v3, final, final for real this time, final, 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 <laughs> um, and it become a mess. And the other one is, hey, now let's say you got a model you're actually pretty happy with as a data scientist, and now you want to uh, deploy in production. You're a data scientist, you don't really know all the production engineering stuff, you don't know what SLAs really mean, you don't know how to achieve that, you don't know what about Kubernetes or containers. You ask the data engineer, production engineer for help. And then this is sort of a conversation that happens a lot among our customers. Hey, here's like something I trained with Scikit-Learn, please deploy it. And here's like something I trained with Spark, here's I trained with TensorFlow, here's I did it with R. Now the production engineers, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm really used to writing Java or Scala code and I'm really good at deploying those to my application server. All of this R, Python, scikit-learn, Spark stuff, I don't know what they are. Um, and <laughs> the most interesting one is, hey, I just read about something interesting on this uh, archive. Can you also deploy this for me? Um, now, let's take a look at what MLflow enables you to do. All right, very simple program. This is the old program. But now, instead of just print, you import the MLflow APIs, and then you actually lock them. Right. All it does is it calls MLflow API, and MLflow actually stores them in the database. And when you launch the MLflow UI, it actually gives you, from the tracking component, all your experiments. So here's just a very simple screen uh, visualization. Let's say you track all the experiments, and now you should actually go in and look at, hey, what is the output for each of the experiments? What do I get? You could even add notes to it. It also tracks your code with the git commit, and it also integrates with Delta um, to give you, so one other functionality Delta uh, gives you that I didn't talk about is time travel. Because we actually save the transaction logs, you could go back to refer to any specific version of the data in the past. And by integrating that with MLflow, we actually allow you to basically reproduce your model end to end by combining Delta data, um, your code itself with the git commit hash and all the parameters that are tracked. So now you can reproduce everything. You can also com um, compare the different runs of the model uh, because that's what you usually want to visualize in a big experiment. Um, the other one is <laughs> the uh, project component of MLflow allows you, uh, sort of offers a standard spec that basically allows you to define a project with the code dependency and the configuration. And then you can actually run the project in a lot of different places. For example, you could run it locally with just the MLflow open source project. You could run it on the Spark cluster. Um, and all that needs to be, do, um, be done is just a single line of command. And here's how a project looks like. You basically have a YAML file. Um, and because a lot of data scientists, a lot of the machine learning dependency is in Python, we basically allow you to define the environment using Conda. And you can write sort of your Python programs there. And this becomes a standard container. Think of it almost like a Maven, but specifically built for machine learning. Um, and you can actually run it pretty much everywhere. 
And the last piece of the uh, ML flow is the uh, spec for models, uh, basically for running them. And um, what it does is really just a simple wrapper. It defines a standard API for here are the different types of models, and here's how I can actually execute them. For example, if it's a TensorFlow specific model, um, I could just run it with TensorFlow itself. If it's a generic model, I could just run an arbitrary Python function. And you can actually deploy, for example, the arbitrary Python function directly in Spark itself, so you can actually parallelize your influence, uh, inference across the cluster of machines, even if you train your model just using TensorFlow itself on a single node. So now, with this standard spec, the production engineer, all they really need to understand is, hey, um, here's, um, here's a command I need to run, because I'm given an MLflow project, and I can just run it across a lot of different environments I have. So the three components, tracking, projects, models, they're really done to make the life of data scientists and also all the supporting staff, including production engineers, data engineers, easy. Um, because we sort of try to understand what our data scientists and all the supporting staff really struggling with every day um, and how we can make their lives better. Yeah. And MLflow is about a year old. Um, we actually open sourced it a year ago, um, which announced the Spark Summit in San Francisco. And it's already gotten 100 plus contributors. And I just looked up uh, PyPy, the Python package index, last night. And there's actually a club, there's more than half a million downloads every month. Um, now, a lot of these downloads are probably CI CD pipelines, so just keep fetching them. Um, but nonetheless, it's pretty uh, impressive for only a one year old project. Right? It's actually solving some real problems for uh, data scientists that I would say historically are overlooked because everybody focused so much on just, hey, how do I? build a machine learning piece of it without looking at the surrounding infrastructure. Um, just to wrap up the talk, Spark was created as a unified analytics engine and really tried to unify big data and AI. But Spark taken the approach of how do we build the compute part um, of this piece. And as we work at more and more with different customers and users, realize there's a lot of other pieces um, even the ones we thought they would solve problems they did not really solve, and people are struggling with. And a lot of the responsibility of this industry, and also Databricks in particular, is we need to be building, uh, understanding the problems users and customers run into, providing higher level solutions so they don't have to spend as much time fiddling with infrastructure, and they can focus on their domain-specific problems. This requires tools to actually unify a lot of different disparate personas, um, require using tools to actually unify different language texts um, and um, sort of go from there. And the two specific projects I talked to you about, one's Delta Lake. A lot of it is about making data ready to support the downstream analytics. And the second one's MLflow. And it's about making, managing the life cycle of all the machine learning projects. All right, um, that's all I have. Um, I can't be here without telling you, hey, we're also hiring. We have offices in Amsterdam, San Francisco, also a small one in Hangzhou, also open to remote um, opportunities. And I think I can take a little bit of question um, with the rest of the time. Thank you. If there's no question, it means I've explained everything perfectly, so I, yeah. I think there's one there. Yeah. Hello? Hi. Um, I had a question about Delta Lake. Yep. Um, so you mentioned that there's uh, this sort of, I guess, compaction step with regards to metadata files. Is that right? Yeah. Um, is there any sort of built-in compaction for the data files? Is this something that you need to run in an out-of-band process, or does it just kind of come for free when you use Delta? Yeah, so um, it's a very good question. Um, we, so it's not something that's done automatically for you right now, although we're experimenting with it. Um, it's actually very easy to do compaction. You could just, for example, schedule a regular job every 30 minutes, and what it, the job is literally one line. It's just Spark, read the file in, and write the file out, um, and do it in a transaction. 
Um, we are experimenting with automatically doing that directly in a hosted service. But part of the challenge with compaction is, depending on data volume, some of them compaction jobs could be very expensive. Um, so some of our customers they explicitly don't want us to automatically compact for them because they worry about the cost that would happen if they don't control it themselves. Um, so it is something we're actively looking at. But um, I suspect it would be more of a, hey, you can opt in to do automatic compaction, but there's a way to, uh, or maybe you can, by default it's on, but then you can opt out in the future just to cover different sort of, uh, use cases. If you shout, I can repeat your question if I hear it. <laughs> uh, oh, the question is, can you compare Dell Lake with Iceberg? Um, the, yeah, I think Dell Lake is more production ready, much more. The two try to probably solve similar problems in a way. Um, Dell Lake has been running in production for a long time. And also, more uniquely, um, one of the big things we are focused on is actually support streaming um, and sort of incremental computation, which I don't think Iceberg does, um, because that's coming from a lot of our sort of real re requirements. I want to see data in more uh, uh, real time, and that's one big difference. But the underlying, I would say, at 20,000 feet, the underlying technology look very similar. All right. I Thank you very much. All right, thank you.